Ah, good. Should work. Hey, man, your video was pretty interesting. It was really nice. Um, it was creative. Uh, you know, sounds like uh, you're a guy that would um, kind of like process, like process. Uh, I, I look at it as a nice process video, meaning how yeah, exactly. showing showing the process of how you're going through it. And that's the kind of stuff we want to teach each other. So I was immediately encouraged by that. That was good. Cool. Uh, so let's let's do this. Um, so do you have questions? What, what questions are on your mind? What's what's uh, or do you want me to start I, talking? I don't have any particular questions. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy just seeing seeing where this goes. So okay. yeah, whatever you want to start talking about. Okay. So um, first of all, uh, yeah. So tell me in your, maybe in your words, um, what's you know what's your perception of this program and the most important thing for you. But you know your your voice was a little muted and um. Uh, in the video, so I couldn't hear some of the things. Right. But yeah. I do get the general drift. I do do get things like uh, meaning, quest for meaning, and uh, totally. yeah. Um, so tell me, tell me what what you're doing right now. How are you supporting yourself, and and then how would this would fit in your your plan of your life? Yeah. Up until a week ago, I was doing technical documentation uh -huh. for a software company that was uh, manufacturing um, crypto trading bots, essentially. So okay. that's what I've been doing for the past three months. Uh -huh. While I was doing that job full time, at the time I was also trying to maintain a part time job uh, teaching kids. It's like a Python like programming language, it's like KidScript. Um, I was also prior to that teaching English online. That's kind of what I was doing during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, prior to that, I was in Mexico also teaching English. Then hmm. uh, prior to that, I was in Oregon. Prior to that, I was in Peru. You know, it goes back. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, recently I've just been kind of using the, the time to figure out what kind of like technical skills were really interesting to me first that I thought that I would be able to learn fairly quickly and then trying to find ways to incorporate that into how I imagined a career for myself that could both be satisfying and um, mm -hmm. somewhat, you know, lucrative to the point where I didn't have to always be thinking about money. Yeah. Uh, so regarding just the experience of six months, I mean, do you have the time to, to do that, uh, basically embed yourself fully in that and do that full time? Yeah, the timing actually works out really well because that job ended. Um, the the coding job I mm -hmm. think might be winding down. Um, the, the teaching job, uh, and yeah, th I, ideally I would definitely have the whole immersion experience. That's what I was kind of hoping for. What's uh, what's your goal? What's your vision? Tell me more about your vision for gaining practical skills of designing and building anything. What is, what is that about for you, philosophically or practically? Yeah, that's, that's a big question. There's a lot of different uh, ways that I can answer it. I guess mm -hmm. the most obvious one or the way that springs to mind is I like thinking about systems sort of at the level at which they have patterns in common rather mm -hmm. than the things that are different, you know, um, academic knowledge tends to be very siloed and what I did when I was doing my graduate work and afterwards was trying to essentially find shortcuts and ways to do one thing without learning all of the necessary intermediary steps. I like figuring out ways to, to transfer knowledge so uh, and also figuring out just like unique opportunities because I think human skills and, and the value of those skills is always going to be context dependent. You know, depending on where you are and um, what the the situation happens to be. So I guess in terms of the sort of knowledge that I want to acquire and the skills of conveying that knowledge to other people, whether it's through actual teaching documentation, um, the same principles would apply as, as would apply to how I understand like the open source ecology model, where you want to have modularity, you want to have scalability, you want to have everything be as transparent as possible so you can adapt it to to your own purposes mm -hmm. um so whether i i take the documentation side of it and in the future i don't make tractors or you know i don't do 3d mm -hmm. printing but mm -hmm. i i 
take the skills that I've learned documenting how to do those processes, which to be honest, they're not processes that I already know how to do. Um, I don't have a lot of like build skill. Uh, I have documentation skill and writing skill, obviously. Um, so it would be a way for me to provide um, essentially an open source portfolio, uh, one thing of my work, because it would, if I understand this job correctly, as opposed to a lot of jobs where I'd be doing a similar thing, the result of that would be completely open source also. So I could use that to you know, uh, convince other people that I knew what I was doing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. How does that relate to, so, so the mission behind this is, it's so, we talk a lot about solving pressing world issues and we're creating a tribe of people that are directly dedicated to do that and getting funded to do so by, hey, we do a few extreme builds on the side and do that about 50% and then 50% goes back to R&D uh, so we can continue developing the, the critical path of the global village construction set, finishing that by 2028. That's, that's a gen generic kind of a schedule. Um, tell me how, what's your perspective on being in a posse like that, uh, which, is, which is focusing on solving pressing world issues. The thing that I want to do for the the crew that we build is to keep expanding that index of possibilities for what that really means. Yeah. Like, one, we can do it. There, one, well, first, there are issues that need to be solved. Two, we can work, understand them and solve them by gaining skills, and we can annihilate these issues by collaborative development. That's that's a generic formula here, and how would you fit in that? That kind of a what can you contribute to that? Well, one of the ways I guess I was thinking about it earlier today actually was that if you design anything, whether mm -hmm. it's like a system or a brand or an organization, mm -hmm. and it becomes the dominant force, the things that people think of when they think of that thing, and and everyone else wants to imitate that model, then you've done something wrong from the beginning because I feel like it's a loss of efficiency. If built into the thing that you're building is recognition that you were the one that built it. So um, I'm the thing that interests me about organizations or ways of, of, of doing things is the potential for it to be decentralized and actually anonymized. Um, so it can have an influence without getting credit because I think like, credit especially if it's demanded like i said it's a it's a efficiency drag it's always going to be something that you could have mm. like the design could be better if it it didn't have built into the, this it, this need for recognition yeah oh, i like it so you're you're even beyond the attribution part you're just like yeah put it out there it's efficient that's is that how you think it's part of how i think too um because I guess the way that I usually consider things is evolutionarily in, in terms more of the environment in which things can evolve or are selected for um, and finding like mapping out that environment I think is more the contributions that I could make the the possibilities and the adaptive landscapes that are hidden because of the distortions because of everyone doing things the, the way that they think that they should be done um, mm -hmm. and yeah, I don't want the pressure of having to make something perfect uh, that other people can use without modifying it for themselves, nor do I want to do so. Because I think the, the idea is that every part of an ecosystem is mm -hmm. contributing to the knowledge generation uh, yeah. through the trial and error. Through, and, you know, so I'm interested in doing documentation really well, um, but I'm also interested in doing it the way that I would do it most naturally and, and having that not be a model people would follow uh, exactly, but like the decentralized system where you have a bunch of different variations and then uh, just through use, through through development, mm -hmm. um, okay. people, okay. yeah. I might get what you're, what you're saying. It's about publishing early and often to the point where you have just a wide range of assets to build upon. They don't necessarily have to be finished like in your video, that was good work in progress kind of stuff, but it's it's there 
and it has value because it's open and you can build upon it. But here's the next question. Revenue models for supporting, so, so product, pr what is product in that context that you're saying right now? How do you monetize it or, or like survive from it? Because, because um, well, in all honesty, big deal out of this project is the last decade we've been doing prototyping primarily, mm -hmm. pretty much zero interest on in uh, business development kind of topics or marketing or anything like that. Now, the last two or three years, that switched to okay, well, we're gonna need some financial feedback loops to make this scale to more than uh, like one person. Or yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so that's the whole focus. It's it's about scalable enterprise models. So in my language is starting to sound like the Silicon Valley stuff. It's like regenerative <laughs> solutions at scale and stuff like that. It kind of sounds sil full of silicone here, but <laughs> <laughs> but at the same time we do need <laughs> we do need the financial yeah. feedback loop stuff that works because because um. I'd like to share one one huge learning is that is that and, and the hippies have kind of shown us that is you can't run into the forest with some polyethylene and a pocket knife and expect to make a modern civilization. You actually need to to provide that w that kind of refinement and quality of life that the the modern system does allow. So, um, does, is there any contradiction for you or that, that's still consistent with your thought process? Um, no, it's actually pretty consistent, I think. Uh, yeah. And my, I guess my attitude towards wealth generation and the ability to, to do that ethically mm -hmm. and in a way that's, you know, mm -hmm. has integrity and is consistent with the other um, modes of thinking that I've developed. It's you know, the last job that I had, and I don't want to go into like too much details mm -hmm. about it, but it seemed like every other time I tried to do something the aspect of it where you had to make money would gradually eclipse the the rest of the mm. endeavor to the point where you weren't really doing the thing that you were doing you were mm. just making money but in a way that resembled the thing that you originally set out to do yeah um yeah. so then i just started to think really like if ever like if if everything is about making money then how do you actually make money um and <laughs> Is it important if the way that you're accruing value in terms of financial value is also accruing um, value in other senses like knowledge? And can you do that? Does it have to be simultaneous? Can you have a funding phase and then switch over? Mm -hmm. And I think it has to be kind of built in, which is sort of what I was saying before. I think like the ideas about the funding mechanisms have to be part of the original project. Uh, and so things that I was thinking of doing are about money, like from the beginning. But the the way that they're about money is also about the other things that I would want to have the project be about, which is like the relationships between the people that I would work with and the governance, you know, like how decisions are made, mm -hmm. um, things like that. So yeah, I have different ways of monetizing um, various things that I've learned how to do, and yeah. I'm kind of eager to try them out. So let's talk talk about the the financial aspect, which is so w say you get trained to build anything particularly the house because the house is the thing that we can monetize um, as in we can be building houses for people to address a need and in the process self housing so don't don't lose sight of the big vision we always want to say okay here's we're solving housing and getting rigorous about what that means on one side mm -hmm. it's it's the most efficient easiest to build build the highest performance lowest cost home but on the other side it's it's also other certain aspects like access, like enterprise training, making sure that's part of the distributive economy, closed loop material cycles, local materials, open source techniques, machines, and so forth. Um, things that are generally regarded as good by ancient wisdom. <laughs> um, nice. So if that's what we get trained for, so because the thing is you would learn to do, for, to build the house, for example, and other things but we're, we're focusing on the house as a way we can say hey we can actually do this for real like we're not going to send you home because oh sorry we can't make money we don't have any money to pay anybody or generate make a living out of so where do you see yourself 
after the completion. Are you are you okay to be part of the crew that say we got to go out and okay we're gonna build a house or two, then we're gonna go huddle back up and do R and D, and continue developing products, collaborative development techniques. Like I think that's that's um, would be up your alley. Um, as in, because the schedule is primarily so Monday through fr Friday, Monday through Thursday, we're doing design training and then practice. So that's computer aided design primarily, learning how to design and build anything, and then actually building these things in the afternoons. Mm -hmm. Friday, it's more about infrastructure development work, building things like a new workshop or a CEB hut or a road or an aquaponic greenhouse or a tractor. And we do that to live with it, to to experience that technology. And in the evenings, we have sessions of enterprise development where we delve into the enterprise models and, and ask the kind of questions you're actually asking right now. Like really nail this, like governance structures and and regenerative enterprise models. What do they look like? And as we pave the road, innovation on every step, including like how, what's the form of you get out. You know, we finish. Uh, I mean, we collab. I mean, you. I don't want to say you get out. We, we're saying we are all collaborating towards enterprise that we can all benefit from, and that's that's a different model. Of it's not like co-opish. It's not like this venture capital. It's not like anything. Yeah. It's it's a different thing. We're we're just collaborating. Collaborative design for a transparent and inclusive economy of, of abundance. That's our key phrase and mission. Um, with that said, what would you, and also, so, so just the things that I do know right now is that we don't want to be making employees. Like, at the end of the yeah. program, we'll help each other become entrepreneurs, set up our organizations if they don't exist already, uh, perhaps use this facility as an incubator space to run the enterprise, possibly go back to your community. So where do you see yourself in that scheme of things after we've completed getting some serious skills and primarily the skill of collaborative development because the Saturdays are dedicated all to collaborative development, seeding global collaborative protocols and actual things like hackathons or incentive challenges right. and inviting the rest of the world to participate in this wholeheartedly so we're supported, we're not doing this alone. First of all, we've got a team, we've got a tribe we're building um, a very friendly tribe of economy of affection, if you've heard of that term. I haven't, I like it though. And um, we are inviting with open borders the whole world to make that out of this world good. Uh, so where do you see yourself in that after the six months? After the six months, if I feel like those are um the the real operating principles that you know on the ground are actually put into place and will be in the future then essentially i'm on board whatever other activities if that like governance structure is in place and i feel like it's genuine then um i would love to build homes build tractors go wherever it one of the things maybe that was hard to hear in the video i was talking about the different like mm. parts of the brain and I spent the past year essentially just trying to work with my mind and mm -hmm. working for other people and how oh, it would sorry just you mean just intellectual work or are you talking about some other development well everything that yeah I mentioned earlier like the teaching English and yeah. then even though it's work I enjoy like talking to kids online it's still completely separate from my physical environment and the mm -hmm. people that I have been seeing in my actual life so the mm -hmm idea of integrating like physical work actually being able to do something with my hands again which i haven't done for a long time other than just you know the the art stuff um to see the things that i'm working on in terms of like machinery which is kind of weird for me to say because it's something that i've never really uh, imagined wanting to do that much but you know actually building real things so having yeah the space where i am the people that i'm working with and the ideas that are informing the entire enterprise having that all connected to me yeah i'm on board i would Mm -hmm. If that all seems like uh, that's really what's going on after six months, then I would do it for for much longer. Okay, so just just trying to tease out this thing like 
expectations about the final final state. It's like expecting to get, to get hired versus expecting to partner. Because we're offering more of the thing we partner. That that kind of deal. Like, are we on the same page on that one? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. I mean, kind of like I was saying before, I like to position myself to be able to adapt to whatever the the future whatever happens um but one of the things that i was kind of imagining i mentioned the appalachian trail yeah. so like if i get the 3d printer and we make small models we can have a barcode on the back of them you know the miniature eco house or whatever mm -hmm. i hike the appalachian trail and everywhere i stop i hand out these things maybe like I stop for a week and um, set up another printer and make more of them if I run out. So that could be like a cycle, uh, a three-month period where I essentially sow the seeds of um, mm -hmm. a marketing campaign distributed where people can either go to the web page on mm -hmm. the little trinket that I give them and then uh, enlist our help, or they can just do it themselves. And then if they're mm -hmm. successful, then maybe like that would lead back eventually to us. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm, I'm more interested in figuring out ways to grow um, the organization rather than just trying to, I guess, like depend on the organization for my own well-being in any sense, financial or emotional or, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that uh, sounds consistent. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um. Um, yeah. I just the I guess I made the the video the way that I did so it wouldn't surprise you that I'm interested in a lot of other things other than just um, building um, stuff but mm -hmm. I am genuinely interested like I feel like if any like activity can uh, embody or incorporate like larger ideas it can be a metaphor for it or you know a miniature sort of representation and so as long as I have kind of like the sovereignty to do whatever job that I want to in my own way, which includes kind of like thinking about it and like you said, the process, then I feel like that can fully be in line with the way that I see the world, even if I'm doing something that I've never done before. Because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the way that I'm learning about it and communicating is the same. Are you talking about throughout the program or afterwards? Sounds like more afterwards or, or where? Or if Tell me a little more, because the thing is, uh, the one thing we talk about a lot is collaboration, and we're all pulling to get things as viable products. Because, like, like the CD go home. There's the thing is that um, I'm not sure if you recognize, but it's it's not it's not something that right now we have uh, like finished product versus development. Mm -hmm. We've built prototypes. We've. Th I live in one. We're building one right now. We're going to build two more before September. But it takes tremendous work to turn that into something that's that's actually highly, highly replicable, full digital model, uh, community around it, design platform, all the things that can make it go and actually have a real impact. So that's a lot of work, and, and that requires close coordination. So I mean, are your thoughts consistent with that? That you're talking about um, bigger vision. That's there's plenty of it. There's every, I think everything we do is is grounded on okay, how do we solve pressing issues, and how are we working beyond ourselves, beyond our needs to say okay, we're part of a a world where we're not free until everybody is free, All right? So with that said. Um, is your thinking how you treat it is that's consistent with collaboration like like we've got a a product to deliver and we're doing it all collaboratively with a team on on site by the way two people already signed up which is great i mean last week so that's awesome and we're, we're continuing the energy so it's us plus whoever signs up before plus the global community so I just want to make sure that you're comfortable that you're not going off into a corner saying, oh, no, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> right, that, oh, I'm, I'm just going to explore this thing, whereas where we need, hey, we've got actually, you know, this is a tight product development process where we're all pulling 
along a certain taxonomy and process of, of product development. It's a standard standard product development process that's that's shifted towards massive collaborative. Yeah. Yeah, I do think that that is in line, but I think it's also one of those things where it's just hard to um, communicate or to you know have just trust someone without actual evidence. So ideally, um, similar to how like cryptocurrencies can be trustless, uh, I could do small things and document the process very well to you know demonstrate, show rather than not tell the you know, way way that I work, because I, I feel like it's in line probably with uh, the amount of energy and, and effort that is put in, um, that would be put in by other people. Um, mm -hmm. It's just, in order for me to effectively do some things, I have to also allow my brain sometimes to, to either like if I'm working on the eco home, take 15 minutes, maybe break and just like draw it, like sketch it just to get a different part of my brain yeah. going. But I, mean, I think the schedule would be amenable to it because we're, the day goes eight to five. Mm -hmm. Then we have the enterprise, enterprise seminar a couple of days a week and then all days once we hit September with a summer extreme design build. Um, but it sounds like we're trying to keep the schedule, definitely like, you know, if you got a, recuperate because part of it is also it's physical work the four hours of builds four days a week or five more like five days a week uh, that's significant so you de definitely got to pace yourself um, but beyond that I mean I'm a meditator I, I, I sit on ass for an hour or two every morning uh, so I understand the importance of that I, and I you know I clear my mind and all of that so I do plenty of that before I'm ready to, to go out into the world um, but it seems like I, I don't necessarily sense any any red flags on anything that you you're gonna go off into a corner and do your own thing. But but that's you gotta understand that that's something that does very well exist. Like throughout just about every workshop, there'll be like one person that, that totally just goes in the corner and, and has a very hard time collaborating. So I just want to make sure that's that would not be the case. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, yeah. It, you're kind of fortunate because you can meet me and work yeah. with me like a weekend or a week prior because I live closer by, I imagine, than, than how, some of the participants. How far are you? Um, you're in Kansas, right? Yeah, I'm maybe 45 minutes south of Kansas City. Oh, like how, uh, what's the city? Your town? Overland Park, basically Stillwell. What is it? Stillwell. S-T-I-L-W-E-L-L, -L -L, or Overland Park. S T I L L. S T I L W E L L. Still well. Yeah. It's kind of like right on the state line. Oh wow, man! <laughs> You're an, another local. Yeah, that's Can what I not believe it. T guess what? I I didn't met a guy in um, Kansas City today. I ended up going to Kansas City, and a guy who works on regenerative development and. Um, also is looking at the fellowship so it's like holy cow this is really cool um yeah uh locals are piping up that's good in fact um yeah yeah, yeah there's there's a few there's a person who come from iowa for the summer of extreme design build so yeah we're <laughs> got the, oh. the midwest covered <laughs> i lived in iowa city for like 10 years <laughs> yeah 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 no it's a small world we're running into all these people uh, but that's cool um yeah yeah, I don't think that the the schedule or anything would be would be a problem. Yeah. Um, so, do you have any reservations about what this is about, or like questions? Like, is this? And then I did this about the seventeen minute video, which it turns out, wow, that was pretty long. Uh, did that all make sense, or how? Yeah, yeah. it it did make sense. Um, I. My, mm. the the blocking point, which I imagine it will be with a lot of people, is just the idea of giving that much money with not an uh, entirely clear idea of, of the outcome. I mean, the, the, the qualms that you would have of me about me going into a corner, uh, I have similar ones. 
I obviously wouldn't think that everyone else in the workshop would like go off into a corner, but you know, th there might be some kind of a just weird cultural thing or like a, a vibe where it's hard for, for everyone to, to work together. Um, so there's also, you know, I've thought, what if I just don't like working in AutoCAD? I think that I would. Um, I, I've worked in Blender before or, you know, whatever tool that it is. Uh, what if it's not as interesting as I think that it will will be? But like I said, because I have a way of sort of integrating everything that I study into a larger, you know, like philosophy that I am interested in pursuing, I think that I will be interested in the stuff that I work on. It might be in my own way, but I think that my way of doing things is equally effective as the ordinary way of doing them. If anything, like I work harder because I bring a lot of other like metaphorical valencies towards whatever it is. But I think that isn't expressed in any like lower quality of work, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, how would that play out, for example, when we're, we're talking about, so we're doing design lessons, we're practicing CAD, and then we're actually building the things that we design or help the designs along with how would that play out for you? So, so for example, we're doing a CAD design, you're, you're questioning, okay, is that going to be actually an enjoyable process? The mechanics of it or? Yeah, um, mm -hmm. I think so. Like I, I was interested enough in Blender to, to do kind of like the first steps, but that's a good example. One of the things that I do, um, or have done is like role-playing games, tabletop role-playing games. I was actually also getting paid to do it with kids uh, like two hours a week. So an, an example of how that would work is we would be making things on the 3D printer and I would say we could make stuff for like a Dungeons and Dragons board. Um, and I might, as a way of practicing designing something useful, design like a castle or a, you know, whatever, mm -hmm. something stupid. Um, because that's just kind of like the process of learning that I've developed by being kind of self-taught over the past 10 years is I come at things from an angle where it's like fun for me and I can practice until I get good enough where I can apply it to, to a real world um, skill or problem. Um, I would ask, so why not practice? Because we see a link between stuff that you do at the entry level. You can. You know, you can design a castle or you can design like this nut for the tractor wheel or something like that. Something that's actually that we're using because we have the choice to select what things we work on. Do you have any issue with with um, applying that? Because one of the things I, I believe that uh, could move society forward is if people just, more people got involved in open sourcing, just the common stuff that's out there. And yeah. towards, towards this idea, what we call distributed market substitution, like it only takes such a very tiny amount um, of energy to get to where modern civilization is if we were to o actually open it, as opposed to keep it all hidden, keep the best stuff hidden because it's all proprietary. And therefore, we're just on this constant cycle of of just reinvention and wasted effort. Whereas we need to do that once, and if it's open source, it lives forever, it's immortal and it can be built upon. But right now there's not enough cores, open cores or open design where that's even feasible or people even see that's possible. You mm -hmm. know, like a budget of say like $1 billion or so, um, Maybe it's like a hundred billion up to, but I would I would venture to say that even like one billion dollars right now is probably enough to open source all of the human technosphere. Um, which, if you think about it, it's like, man, that would be like if we did that once. But the problem is you cannot get a hundred billion dollars. That's what we're actually working on creating that because the revolution shall not be funded. Right. So, um, but that's the kind of uh, thinking we're trying to instill. We're saying, okay, let's collaborate in a simple stuff that's just the basics of, that everybody uses and it's part of everybody's life, but right now it remains obfuscated and inaccessible, not open source, not capable to, to get that 
virtuous feedback loop started eventually I'm freeing people up because we're saying okay uh, transcend artificial scarcity in the material base then you can start talking about evolving as a person mm. uh, that's that's the kind of big concept we're saying oh we're just gonna grow potatoes build houses and things like that so that we can actually prosper and get to the self-determination part the higher rungs of Maslow's pyramid or transcendence at the end of that game flow experience is a norm people learning and, and practicing how to be better humans and all that kind of stuff um, that but you got me going on that with with your comment about well what would you choose to design like can you can you collaborate in a way where or do you have anything against the idea that okay we work on you know we agree that we work on important things like we want to work on important things actually move society forward in a certain way um, or is that um, is, is that consistent with, with your thing? Because like, like you mentioned the castle thing. I would say, well, yes. let's, let's design, when you're teaching your children, let's design something that actually you we will use and actually, believe it or not, your children are going to contribute to the state of art of documenting, say, this tractor or aquaponic greenhouse that are, like, important things or, like, how to build a ball bearing, you know, like, some little piece of that. But it's it's an important problem, like how to... How to build a ball bearing is a very important problem because civilization, you can say in one way, uh, the ball bearing is the most advanced feature of civilization. And it's actually the air bearing, I would say, uh, which is responsible for vacuum pumps and high speed things that spin very fast that allow semiconductor technology to happen. Um, but yeah, so are you on board with that? Can you help us work on, on a, can we all work on important things yeah <laughs> yeah i th i think so like the one caveat or thing that i would say is it's really difficult to tell what is important beforehand like a priori i think like a lot of times the importance is discovered through the massive distributed generation of unimportant things so you you need all the unimportant things and unimportant processes to to figure out um, what's important and with the idea of like you could open source all technical knowledge or whatever for a billion dollars I think that the knowledge that you would need to have it really open sourced for a billion people or whatever would be the contributions of those billion people either just as yeah. consumers or as developers or as users I don't think you can create the you know the the knowledge isn't separate from the people doing the knowing. I mean, that's, I think, like the true collaboration is you don't have knowledge that you then open up to people, but you open up the process so that yeah. it can, it can um, become something worthy of like every person that is involved in, in the, the use of it, I guess. Uh, the other like really quick thing that I will say, just related again back to like the, the neurology, I think like in the same way that games and play, just like at a locomotive level, um, mm -hmm. I remember like going to Yellowstone with a field ethology teacher and like watching buffalo when they're young just like prance around. It's necessary for muscle development, mm -hmm. you know, and it's necessary for developing the neural yeah. connections to escape from prey eventually or to do these things. And I think like in the same way you can't separate important versus unimportant um, human activities when they feel important. Uh, are they are important to someone? I think that's like part of the the data, you know, part of the the experiment. And you can't just like dismiss it and focus on something that fits more with your view of how everyone else should think about what they need. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think I get that. Yeah, because maybe the the castle design would really work for an eco home, and you wouldn't you mm. wouldn't know unless you like let your imagination kind of go free. Yeah. Forever. Yeah, it could be, could be. And I think it's somewhat like a operational slash strategy slash philosophy question, like how do we winnow down to what's what's important? But at the same time, like, okay, so th say there's the Global Village Construction Set 50 tools. Mm -hmm. uh, are you on board to to say develop those first if we know that they're you know they've got a certain metric behind them saying okay they're they're part of very important economic processes 
for the earth brings me back to that question or is that consistent with developing that say, uh, by so that we have a effectively a, a construction set for rebuilding settlements or civilizations from scratch that's is that all consistent there yeah of course um mm -hmm. you know i mean i want to be involved with this to learn from you and your experience having done this for 10 years or however long it is like you've thought about this particular aspect more um thoroughly than than i have so yeah re just like you don't want to reinvent code or write the same code i mm -hmm. i want to learn from the things that you've observed about what is important i mean yeah just because i think that there's some room for experimentation and evolution doesn't mean that i'm you know i don't think that yeah everything that you have right now is is not incredibly valuable okay yeah 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 no i mean i think the promise we make to each other it's like i, I want to learn constantly that it's about lifelong learning that's the promise of we're building i don't know how much you picked up of the idea of the osc campus which is what we're building here we don't we're not far I mean, we've got some infrastructure but a facility which, which provides education regenerative agriculture you've got production you've got basically all the functions of a, of a settlement and that's done in a completely regenerative way and that can be replicated widely as a as a new new economic paradigm for how you produce and meet needs um, and replicating that widely around the world that's the that kind of a concept requires constant learning um, we talk about uh, talk about the idea of movement entrepreneurs or people who uh, live in facilities like that which are effectively a way to to bootstrap your own existence you don't have to worry about money because you can make that easy it's like the promise in one of my videos I said we work like 20% of the time to make needs make the needs happen and then we can do um, what we think is important for for evolution of humanity or solving pressing world issues uh, that's that's the kind of model, but that, that's what we're after. Uh, would you be interested in being a person who actually builds one of these communities elsewhere, or have you thought thought that way? Yeah, I have. Um, maybe a little smaller scale, not in terms of a community, but I did mm -hmm. definitely think of using the um, industrial processes on, for example, my brother's farm in Fort Scott. I think like that would be a good kind of test case. And I actually have talked to him about turning that into a place where people could come and learn about organic um, farming, which is like what he's really into. Um, yeah. I mentioned the farm in Oregon too. I would like maybe in collaboration with some people there to yeah set up another kind of workshop. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That, I, I, I'm a long-term environmentalist and this isn't just like a completely new preoccupation even though I'm coming at it kind of from a different angle I've been wanting to do something like this for a really long time mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah if you weren't if this opportunity didn't, didn't show up what would you be doing next month then what was your normal life look like well like I said I just lost my last job last week so I'm yes. still kind of like reconfiguring everything um, I was planning on just being able to work remotely, and so I was thinking about where I could live independent mm -hmm. of work. And I have some really good friends in Chicago. Um, I was kind of thinking of moving there. I also considered moving to Lawrence. Um, I mentioned Estonia, too. That's been like yeah. a plan for a really long time. Uh, but more realistically, I probably would have um, ended up, yeah, maybe just in Chicago or um, Oregon again. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you, you did English? You have an English PhD in English? Mm -hmm. Yeah, 19th century US literature. And when you were talking about utopias and stuff, one of the things I kind of studied was uh, you know, like the Blythesdale romance, Nathaniel Hawthorne, people going out into the wilderness and trying to create a utopia. Um, so the historical versions of that and then also the fictionalized, fictionalized representations of it. And I uh, have one of my chapters on my dissertation about Looking Backward by Edward Bellamy, which is like the classic utopian socialist text in like 1888 so, yeah. are there do you see like for example from that text is, do you see some particular learnings that we can take or 
Well, one of the things that I took away from it that I thought was kind of interesting is that he wrote that as a socialist tract, you know, um, what was it, Young West, Jonathan West, someone who wakes up in like Boston in the year 2000, mm -hmm. it's a communist utopia. But other people who are more conservative then wrote sequels to it, like um, looking further backward. And then they took the same characters but they realized they like saw through the curtain and realized it was really a dystopia and that everything was controlled and then edward bellamy's supporters like would write another mm -hmm. so there ended up being like four or five of these novels mm -hmm. and so they had a political discourse through what nowadays would be the illegal copyright infringement because it couldn't have happened if they would have enforced copyright there wouldn't have been the political discourse um uh, why because they were borrowing from each other's texts so much or like just because the way that they were arguing politically was through the adaptation of the actual story like continuing it you know what i mean it'd be like if you argued against batman by making an unauthorized batman sequel and having the criminals win or something uh -huh. um so that's uh -huh. again to return to the point like stories and art and music and stuff it is unimportant and like inessential but it also like has been as powerful of a driving force in terms of historical change, I think, as any any feat of engineering like that ball bearing. Narratives you'd know. say you'd say narratives we, we share are would be as important. Like the cultural evolution is just as important as the, the material. So the the grand old idealism versus materialism debate kind of yeah and i think it it's as much about how we share stories how they're selected how they're remembered who gets to tell them yeah as it is the the content themselves well yeah because uh, i mean we found out that the biggest challenge to our work is the cultural story of, that we have about collaboration mm -hmm. that's uh, that's why i should write a book for you guys that's what i'm saying there you go i love it i love it <laughs> no it's that that's true though like if you think about it like why why hasn't so in 2008 we published the first brick press that worked really well it cost 5,000 in materials if you build it yourself you could buy the next competitor for fifty thousand dollars or fifty two thousand dollars and it surprised me that nobody started a business doing this I haven't because personally in-house we haven't because we're been busy prototyping more stuff continuously till till releasing the first products recently but it's I, I believe part of it is or maybe all of it it's the narrative we have like who are we like we're not we're not entrepreneurs or creators right now we're kind of consumers that's that's the narrative we hold um, in a ma major way so to shift that that's that's that I actually think is the biggest one of the biggest challenges we face because otherwise people would be snapping this up and this would be spreading further but it's not, so it's, a, it's a, the thing that emerged, it's, wow, it's a, definitely a complete cultural uh, thing of the mind, right? It's like it almost doesn't matter like what the technology uh, would bring. Yet at the same time, we're, we're saying, oh, okay, we are going to bring some technology like a house or these other things that can have an impact, um, but maybe there's a better way or a more, more integral approach. Like maybe how do we learn to tell stories better? You know, I guess. Yeah, I don't know. Or like radical scalability where people can be involved at smaller scales, kind of like 3D prototype with a little miniature thing. Um, I mean, I'm, you're, you're already doing that, I think, with like the smaller workshops and ways for people to get involved. But yeah, I think just it's kind of natural for humans not to believe something is possible until you see it being done by other people around you, mm -hmm. you know, like imitation mm -hmm. is the easiest way to, to learn um, and stories are important but I, I think also just actual physical space and location and the things that are nearby and the, the people that are nearby I mean that's the other thing I guess you can take from the utopias of history and the ones that kind of failed is it, it's all about like either too much isolation or too much influence from the the larger culture. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But yeah, definitely creating your own story is, is kind of a part of it and transforming the story into a narrative that people can both take meaning from 
inspiration, but then also like practical, like like Thoreau, I guess is a classic example, Walden Pond, just very, he did good documentation, kept an exact record of, you know, how much he was spending on stuff. But at the same time, it was like a poetic evocation of like why you should live that way. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The things you could learn. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. What else? What else? Um, tell me more. Uh, let me cut the. I'll stop the recording here. Okay. Um, so that's pretty good so far. So. I think probably any personal kind of issues, if the ideological stuff is in place, would be resolvable. Um, situations, I guess, where I've experienced something similar, we weren't actually working together. It was just like a cohabitation thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, yeah, that's that's something that makes me uncomfortable is if like you would rather live somewhere else, but because of whatever arrangement, you, you have to live in the same space. Um, that said, I've lived, you know, I, I, I lived for a year with a woman in Mexico that I didn't know and couldn't communicate very well with, I also worked with another English teacher who was a complete different personality from me, but, you know, we just made it work and, and got our jobs done and we still communicate and are friends now, even though, like, while we were working together, we had, um, some issues. So I have... Yeah, experience with situations where it's not ideal, but I also have a lot of experience um, dealing with them, and in a way other than just going into a corner and you know not participating or talking to people. Mm-hmm. I, I feel like I could even be a facilitator if that problem happens with other people. I could be one of those who tries to draw um, the person feeling left out of the activities back into the process. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What, do you see? Do you sense um, when you say that about the chemistry of all the people working together? I mean, what do you see? Do you see some tangible things to watch out for? Like, because um, to me, it's like um, the way I look at it as creating a tribe of people who want to to do world change and and get pretty focused around generally accepted ideas of what what people think that means and I, th- I think I do believe we can define some things based on what what society knows and all of that so uh, and that's that's like a high grand grand vision there and we still haven't solved like in practice I mean we're talking about solving it in practice yes we're gonna work out that yes there's economic models of efficient production we're all helping each other to succeed at that to make life easy because after all there's the, the the concept is and i'm recording this as a second part in case we want to okay. publish this um this i, I just kind of cut this into two pieces in case uh, just in case um but um the promise to me that if you, if i can summarize it, it's kind of hard to communicate but because there is no, really no precedent where there's an open enterprise framework people are helping each other they are open at the same time and they're inviting to open open economically they share their enterprise models as well as operations and all of that so so somebody in fact we encourage people to beat us out of business because if you do and you're open well if you do and you don't share first of all we know our stuff works and it's awesome because because like these people are kicking our ass and but two if they share then it's like man we just got all this free R&D and my our life is just so much easier and it's such an explosive this is like to me like the heaven on earth kind of thing this is like divine intervention coming to make everybody's life better because on first principles scarcity is only artificial and that goes to first principles. There's 10,000 times more power that comes from the sun, which is the ultimate arbiter of what we can do as a civilization. And this gets into now how civilizations tap more than that power. Uh, I, I don't know if you've heard of the concept of Kardashev scale. That's a, that's a mm-hmm. concept of 
how much of the power of the star that feeds us do we use like one Kardashev scale one is where we use all the power that can come from the Sun and then there's higher levels where now you're starting to tap the power of the entire galaxy and further but we are nowhere near even just tapping the available energy that we have to humans so by first principles any kind of naysaying oh the earth is collapsing and so forth is is just rubbish by that kind of first principles thinking because energetically we can recover in a second yes we would have to bring back life forms that we've destroyed in the forest all the all the deserts but that's not a problem that could happen in a few years if we wanted to uh, even though it took centuries and, and millennia to destroy it that way. We have the technological power today to, to correct it like that, in, in my viewpoint, because technology is extremely, extremely powerful today. Um, but from that perspective, if so uh, where am I going with this? The idea of life being e easy because the, the scarcity mindset is a total cultural creation. There's no natural basis for it in many ways. Um, and applied to economics and people getting along that means wow every there's enough for everybody and we can all get along and we're creating a little micro cluster of that in our enterprise program we're trying to draw out people that are saying yes we are going to do that we're going to collaborate on making life very very easy for us and also trying to spread that to the world so it's not like we're developing a private club this is about a very public club of prosperity. Um, so so that's, uh, that to me is the, the kind of a philosophical uh, connection between everybody. So as long as everybody in the crew appreciates collaboration or the possibility that such a thing can exist even, then we're golden because we're, we're collaborating and we're not losing sight of uh, making an easy life for ourselves and for everybody because we share everything, all the know-how for how to do that so to make it replicable so that to me seems like like a sufficient criterion for getting along <laughs> what do you think yeah i do think that that's right um a lot of the tension comes from the idea that it's a zero-sum game or that it's a dark forest is another way of saying it um just mm -hmm. everyone kind of waiting to figure out the position of everyone else so they can pounce on them and, and devour them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and scarcity and competition and uh, yeah, the, the idea that collapse, I guess, is irreversible. Um, in terms of stories, yeah, that's one of the most, most harmful and, and dangerous and un unnecessary. Speaking of Iowa, uh, one of the communications professors that I know at the University of Iowa, his name is uh, Kimber McLeod. I think, yeah, he wrote a book called Freedom of Expression, and he actually got the title of Freedom of Expression as a registered trademark, just to illustrate how like easy and, and pointless it was. But he uh, was one of the first people that introduced me into, yeah, just how damaging like copyright can be in terms of things like genetic research and like crop, um, yeah, like just farming equipment. That's why I think that this is such an effective um, pressure point is because it's like so obvious that that's just like something that people should be able to learn mm -hmm. how to do and, and to make. One, I don't know, I, I have to kind of like express a slightly different point of view on the idea that we have the technology to reverse biodiversity loss because I kind of don't think that we do. Um, I think that it's sort of like the burning of the Library of Alexandria uh, mm -hmm. and that the knowledge that the earth has been accumulating over billions of years has to be living like you, it's not yeah it has to be embedded in the systems that it's actually like evolved within you can't sort of like extract it and and or restore it like if the system's gone then it's just gone it's just like a spoken language if no one speaks it anymore you're not going to bring it back with the dictionary what about like the stuff where uh, we're gonna rebirth the the woolly mammoth using genetics you know about that kind of stuff yeah but it what about the mi microbacteria in its gut what about the food that it ate what about the migration patterns that it had what about yeah. the entire web of like other relationships that it had that, that existed in like a delicate balance i mean that's yeah we can I, take it, but that's the best we can do it. <laughs>
<laughs> no, I, I hear you on that. Um, but it's not, I mean, I think the point to take out of that is it's not like cataclysmic. It's like roaches, sharks, and humans are still going to be around, right? And yes, there is a loss. I, I, I completely sympathize with that. So it's not, it's not exactly, I mean, um, replaceable, but, but for many purposes, it, you can say it is, right? It's not, is that something you want to get super depressed about, right? Or is it? Or is it super depressing altogether? Um, I mean, it's something that I've been thinking about for, for a while, so it's not, not super depressing. Uh, I do, something that I alluded to in the video is I see similarities between scales a lot of times. So the ecological and then the social, but also the, the neurological. Um, and I was just like listening to stuff about the different hemispheres and like the left hemisphere, you only really think of things that are in front of you, like in mm -hmm. your view, like if people have, I think I'm getting the hemispheres right, but if you get one damaged, uh, then if you're looking the other way, you can't even logically acknowledge the existence of buildings on the other side of the street mm -hmm. or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's a tendency to like tokenize reality and have the labels and the categories that we have for it ignoring the fact that they are irreducibly embedded in a contextualized system yeah. um you know like everything that we see and yeah. think and feel like it's embedded in something much larger than than we're perceiving yes. uh and so that makes me cynical about the ability of humans to deliberately reproduce the things that they are embedded in yeah uh but we can still regreen the sahara yeah so yeah that, i mean it's a, which yeah you can create the conditions for things to evolve and to regrow, and but it's not going to go back to the level of diversity that it was before for another million years. That's the one thing you can't design is like time. You can't force evolution. Um, and that's just, I think, like the, the map can't equal the territory. Uh, computers are never going to be as complicated as, as biology, in my opinion. So you 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 don't think the singularity is going to come? No, I'm not a Kurzweil uh, <laughs> believer. You think that's um, why? Is is there any principle that we know of that says that? So if things are improving and getting or improving or getting more advanced, is there some fundamental breaking point? Because the technology is getting better, right? Uh, that, I mean, the, fundament, the fundamental rule, I would say, is just like entropy or the conservation of momentum or whatever. I think mm -hmm. like there's probably a set amount of information and what's happening right now is a very rapid transference of information from the biological to the digital. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. But I think that the rate of destruction of the biological is far greater in terms of the loss of complexity than is being built or extended out in, into cyberspace. I think we're losing a lot mm -hmm. more than we're gaining. Because we're just moving from the right side of that brain to the left side, and we don't realize all the stuff that we're not seeing. Does anyone talk about this? Is this uh, anybody? Right as far as I, as far as I know, it's just me. I don't know. It's pretty far out, dude. Right uh, to say that, no. That's 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 actually quite <laughs> interesting. Um, uh, that's a good point. A very good point. I must say. Yes, we, we are getting, uh, we're shifting the hemisphere, like, we're, this is digital, yes, that can be super complex, but without the con whole context of, the whole contextualization of it, we're losing yeah, something. Think, yeah, like, that's when you, when you meditate, you, you stop identifying with your thoughts and identifying with the thing, doing the thinking, not like the individual, but the actual systems that are responsible for your thoughts. Okay, but tell me, so this is getting into philosophy, this is kind of stuff that it's almost uh, like, it's almost like enterprise, well, it's actually the underpinnings of enterprise, like if we could uh, understand enterprise more clearly, like, okay, what are the end goals of enterprise or activity, uh, by understanding these deeper questions, but um, if, for example, we can get this whole boatload of diverse, like, like a Sahara desert right now, which you get like maybe some some I don't know like dung beetles or something, <laughs> little snakes running around or some critters, but net, then you turn it into a lush forest with certainly great diversity. Um, I mean that's gonna be way better than today, right? Or no? Yeah, absolutely better. Like 
because it's better in itself, but it also then can be a node in like the, the bigger ecological network to help other systems heal. But if, for example, the oceans heat and become acidic and microplankton mm -hmm. die or whatever, and yeah, the, the, the be trouble. cycles of, you know, whatever the, the chemical composition of air, you know, we can't breathe. Uh, yeah. It, I mean, the f fact is, I think it can go one way or the other. It's an extremely complex system. There's no guarantee it's going to balance itself out. I, I'd say, right? Yeah, which is why I, the modularity approach is the only one that has any possibility of of the outcomes mm. of you know survivability, survivability, because we don't know what the particular yeah. um, manifestations of climate disruption are going to be. But we know that we're going to have to move rapidly to different areas and like f fix things that are destroyed by. I mean, I guess yeah, that's where. I am and have been on board with the larger project, I guess, for... Um, but but what about this compression? I mean, look, we've compressed build time from months to days, and or design time from months to days. Why can't we compress evolution? Because <laughs> evolution, by definition, is the Stochastic? playing out of competing forces. And I think, like, the what's evolving is different ways of thinking about like capital and and resource and by extension like all of human relationships because i mean like that's to to go back to something i i apologize if this was in like the first video so it's not going to make any sense but the the idea of like maybe why people haven't started doing the builds and, and making the tractor engines and stuff it's because the kind i mean one theory i have this is the way my brain works i come up with mm -hmm. a lot of like mm -hmm. hypotheses it could be that the kind of people that are interested in this way of thinking have probably made life choices that don't end them up with a lot of money. So that's the problem with money, is it's supposed to be a universal method of exchange where everyone can kind of agree on the value, but in reality it's the opposite. Like, money has more variance of value and stuff attached to it than probably like any other thing <laughs> that we could talk about. You know, like, it means radically different things to different people. Yeah. And I think that adds a lot of stressors to the initial round of getting to know people and getting them on board with the process is you have to get over the initial hurdle of someone giving someone else money and having that involve like a level of sort of like speculation about the future and like trust, which if we lived in a society where we didn't always have to worry about Maslow's like lower level um, hierarchical needs, then we could just skip that step. Yeah. But like we... We live in a world where that's a, like money is the way that we think about everything. Uh, it's like mm. our religion that permeates, you know, and we can we can try to get around that, but it's it's impossible because like it's gonna have something to do with everything that we do. Are you an outlier in, in your philosophy? Like, do you feel alone because, or do you have a like when you're in, in your social context? Do you have a lot of people to talk about this with, or you're like a you're far out man? Like kind of like I mean I feel kind of far out myself a lot of times when I'm just dropping this stuff that I t talk about. Do you, do you feel yourself that oh, man? This is like you're pretty far out in a certain advancement of your thought in some of these things, or humble yes and no, course? and maybe it's just because this is how I'm seeing everything now. But I think it does have to do with the hemispheric thing. The way that I think and talk was absolutely common in, in you know, every university that I went to, uh, especially because I was, you know, in like the English cultural studies departments. So people thought very innovatively, very radically, but then they all got jobs within academia and, and just became professors or they, you know, went into a normal corporate job. So I'm not unusual in the way that I think. I'm unusual in that my left brain and right brain haven't completely split yet. So I can't do something with my life that isn't at least somewhat in line with the way that I thought, oh. which is the problem I had with my last job. And uh, which is, yeah, I don't know. So it's unusual for someone to, to both think the way that I do and try to act, <laughs> you know, having something to do with that. Oh, that's pretty good. It uh, sounds pretty interesting. Uh, sounds like uh, you could drop some theory on the rest of us. You can, it sounds like you can teach us a bit about this. And this is what it's about. So we're all teaching each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, writing especially. I, 
that's I like communicating that way. I mean, I like communicating anyway, but I feel like I'm most effective with writing when I can sort of sit down and plan out what I want to say. Have you ever written copy, as in marketing stuff? I've kind of tried to to stay away from it on principle, um, mm -hmm. and that was one of the things. There's a fine line between technical documentation and marketing. Um, the positive side of that, you could say, if you don't have marketing and just do good technical documentation, the tec technical documentation becomes its own marketing. Uh, mm -hmm. But the other side of it is that oftentimes you skew the tec technical documentation in such a way to make them use or think about a product in such a way that constrains the value to your ecosystem and, and prevents them from seeing how they could move their business elsewhere. <laughs> wow, man. So so how would this apply to, um, so say we're doing documentation on a CD go home, how would that yeah. look, look different then? What do you, different than what? Um, if it had then, marketing and not had marketing? What is the particular angle? Can you just describe it? Like, say we're publishing, because one of the things we're going to publish is, is a, an extensive manual. We'd like to publish that to enable anybody to replicate the enterprise or to build it or to design it, redesign it, or how to design it in the first place. It's a, called the Extreme Enterprise Manual. That's, that's what we want to do the large scale collaborative development upon. Uh, but how would you see some sp specific properties that you can immediately point to like this is a unique value proposition of how I would go about the writing here's X about how I'm writing it that's a unique value proposition that's it, or just simply something in plain terms something that is valuable and gives a lot of value to the world would, can you point to something like that or like um, lucidity like hey this is free of actually free of any bias, let's say? I mean, I don't know. Is there some value proposition that you've got up your sleeve that you can think of? Let me start with kind of like a negative example and then I'll try to think of a positive one. The one that you, you wouldn't want to do is the bait and switch where you quote a price and then you say that that's what the home is going to cost and then in reality that was for a version of the home that was different than the one that you put on the cover or something like that or you know it's like the classic thing if you're trying to sell someone you give them the pamphlet or whatever it is so so they're actually holding it and then you can like make it hard for them to give it back um, so you can do the same thing with technical technical documentation or any other kind of writing where you sell them on something um, at the beginning and then you introduce the hidden terms or and that's the kind of stuff that I don't like. Uh, in terms of like how you would more positively express good technical documentation in order to market something. Um, having, I mean, part of me wants to say just like making it crowdsourced would be the, the, the viral way of doing it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, that's what we're trying to do. So it sounds, uh, we'd like to get 6,000 people. That's a funky number, but I think that's actually what it takes to, to do this. 6,000 people over three days, like tag team 24 uh, seven, which is a, like a, this huge compression of time. But I think that's executable, like practically wise and product wise. Um, but yeah, that's, this will be beyond anybody, any single person, it has to, a lot, a lot has to come together for that to succeed. We haven't done it yet, but we'd like to do that. Yeah, I guess it goes back to what I was saying like at the very beginning where if you build in the need for something to be recognized, then it's becoming less efficient. I think all marketing also is an inefficiency. Um, mm. <laughs> yeah, that's true though, yeah. So I, I also feel like people and organizations are usually more transparent than they think that they are, and like people are more savvy about reading what's really going on mm. so i think like if you just document things honestly and care about clearly conveying the information rather than promoting some sort of image of a business or some sort of enterprise that that is a narrative but you're not really like recognizing it as a narrative um uh, i don't know mm. okay that's an all interesting mm. um 
tell me more about yeah so you mentioned about this the the thing about the high cost of certain things and how does that play out in this problem do you have any other suggestion of how how that could be done with what we're doing like say just on the price structure of, of the osc apprenticeship you could do it where part of the apprenticeship is trying to develop your own enterprise uh some some way of like offsetting the cost of the program through working like one or two hours a day on something um, unspecified at the beginning. Like for me, I thought about making NFTs. Uh, I've thought of just like paying some of my artist friends to collaborate on something that they wanted to do. What? What are NFTs? Uh, Non-fungible tokens. So they're like things that are created on the Ethereum blockchain usually and that, that people can buy and sell them, trade them just like cryptocurrencies, okay. but they represent like a non-fungible, like a unique um, object, so it can be anything. You could make, like, the video that I made. I could turn that into an N NFT, and then um, people could buy it and sell it and have an individual copy, or like a, a work of art or music. You could take a picture of the first eco home and sell it as an NFT, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or doing like a Twitch channel and and broadcasting the things that you're working on in the shop and, and trying to. I don't know. Try to, um, try to generate some revenue that way throughout the process? Or if not generate revenue, put in place the ideas and maybe like business plan necessary to, to generate revenue after the six months. Because that was kind of like the thing that I was dealing with is I'll have to spend the time learning these things and then also that time trying to set up the next step, whether it's like looking for a job or, or figuring that out. So, I mean, I, I understand like ideally it would form its own like enterprises with the things that you learn, but that's, that's again, like a lot to, to sort of like take on faith at the beginning. But what about the ideas that we're supposed to collaborate on? Because cause what, you're, what I'm hearing you're proposing is that we're, we just fragment the effort so now you have a bunch of people working on, on different things, whereas there's already a huge core, huge elephant that we're already building upon for those last miles of enterprise that are so close and sweet. And that's the reason why I think this is possible right now, because we do have that opportunity. Without it, we'd be like, everyone comes in, we're having fun for six months, but bye-bye at the end because we cannot sustain ourselves. How many people have you had that have been able to go on and sustain themselves after well, we, learning these things? Yeah, but we haven't done this. This is new. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> like, it's, yeah, it's it's hard to get the first um, generation of, you know, the first version. People have to have things to look at. And that's one of the things that, I can hopefully uh, help with is because I'm a storyteller and I think about speculative fiction and how my speculative um, stories apply to my own life and I feel like this is a good story uh, and once you tell it once you don't need to tell it again you can document it and then it'll be there as like a the left hemisphere it's something that, that people can actually see so so how much so clarify how how much value do do you see so so there's all this prior work that we have done and, and the cd go home which is a v very near product release or you can call it a product because i mean you can build it right now and the, the techniques of how you actually build it to make it efficient are pretty much proven so you're saying that you cannot say oh well that doesn't really have so much value and we can even think about working on different things even though we have that in front of us as available prior art because i i said in a video actually in a in a promo video i said how fast we develop simply depends on available prior art if we have a lot of it then we are close and we are golden because somebody's already done decades or years many years of development to get it close to uh to close to that the place where you can capture value back from it because until until it's at a certain point you're you're the hippie running into the woods with polyethylene and a pocket knife yeah. and you and you don't have 
you end up going back to the city because you couldn't support yourself. Right. So, what's tell tell me more. The value proposition. I mean, it seems you're not selling the plans for the eco home because those are going to be open source. What you're selling is the experience of learning how to understand the plans well enough to implement them and get the hands-on experience working with other people who are doing the same thing, which you can't get online or, or through documentation, no matter how good it is. Like, um, There's education, and I think the bigger, uh, probably the bigger value will be actually turnkey builds by the people that we train. Uh, because we found that very few people end up, yeah, there's, of course, there's going to be some, but the number of people who actually build that house themselves, I would estimate to be between 200 and 2,000 in all of the United States. Just kind of, we've had some discussions on where that number comes from. But as far as mm -hmm. a house that a people can, person can buy, that's tens or hundreds, hundreds of thousands of potential customers for that. Uh, so so I think the, the bigger problem, product like in, in terms of monetization or like value that can return back to the project would be actually turnkey builds that's a definite thing that emerges from this and that's that's what we're saying we can, we can do that we can go on a, an efficient sprint of five days where we put in two, 24 people times 200 hours per so 200 hours per day that's 24 people times eight hours in five days, we've put in a thousand hours. That's a conservative estimate for how long it takes to build one C eco home. We're, we think it's probably going to, you can probably take it down to 500, let's say a thousand conservative. But, but that's the thing. This is like, okay, wow, you've got economic power in that kind of a, a proposition. You can, you can um, redeem the value of that to a person who wants to affordable eco home. Yeah, but the the barriers to that I don't think are technological. It's again the the problem of like the people that are interested in the open source philosophy might not be the people that would have fifty thousand dollars even to spend. Yeah, on but they don't have to. They're they're, they're standard people. They they just want a house. But then why wouldn't they just uh, hire a normal construction company for a prefab? Because it would be more expensive, but they would be 100% certain that they know what they would be getting and that they um, wouldn't have any surprises. There's nothing less, than, than, nothing less than what we will offer to make it a turnkey product. That's, that's just part of the game. That's what we're getting to. That's what I'm saying. The technology, we're still developing that. That's why we need the grand global collaboration of effort of the fellowship, the Summer X, we're prototyping more and more there. So I think you're under the assumption that this product exists or can be done better. It does not exist. Mm -hmm. And we have not seen anything come close to probably 50% or we're 50% to say like one half to one third the cost of industry standards. So that's a, that's a significant thing. So that that definitely is a value proposition. That's what we're after. Just to, just to clarify. I mean, that's that's the promise. Yeah, that makes sense. And it does say something that you have the option where it's the thousand dollars, and then you would work um, later on to to repay the money. If you make that as one of the options, you know that that says to someone that. You do believe that it does have the the potential um, to to be monetized, uh, yeah. But your in order for the six thousand dollars to really be valuable for the people going through the apprenticeship, they also have to make the decision that they're going to be doing that with their lives for a significant amount of time. Uh, so that's not only their time investment, financial investment. It's also, I mean, speaking of narratives, it's kind of like a narrative investment. They're saying that that's who I am, and I'm going to like invest myself in this project as, as the way that I exist in the world. And that is also like putting a lot of um, confidence in it.
Uh, well, I mean, that's why we have options. Like, if if you want to be doing this, I mean, the goal is fifty percent of the time we work on the actual builds, so we can fund the unbridled R and D that nobody else would pay for the rest of the time, and potentially it would even be better than that like we only have to do, do go at it 25 percent of the time because we're getting so efficient and so good that uh it's actually so positive that way um but the thing is that that's what i was asking like what do you see yourself doing it's like the option is there if you if you don't think you this is for you you don't feel like this promise of collaborative development is doing for you that then of course you can go on your own if that's not if you find out that's not um, you know that's not one of your highest values that you you'd want to work for like ie like um, collaborating to make life easy so that we can work on pressing world issues in a very direct way like okay here's housing next thing we can say oh, okay let's solve for for carbon dioxide which is gonna roll out hydrogen cars which are an available technology today um, and that's that's actually what we want to do like probably in three years go to okay let's solve energy next and then solve material problems as a means to uh, other issues um but yeah so that's that's the thing we're we're saying okay we're gonna get into this promise of uh collaborating on, on larger issues even with the house we're saying okay let's make the best house make it affordable uh try to solve housing uh, of course there has to be a better part so it's like like when you say oh well what about the other guy that can build a house that's more reliable or whatever no no no, that's not that's not what it's about we have to better means we're better that means we're more reliable more features more ecological less polluting high higher energy efficiency, everything across the world ac across the board better faster stronger that's that's what we're trying to get to be because we're saying hey if we actually collaborate we eliminate those inefficiencies that's the only place we can end up. Yeah, what about marketing though? <laughs> well, yeah. Like that's the, I don't know. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, what about marketing? That in order for the the best most efficient um house to win mm -hmm. you have to have an environment where the the best project wins and not the one that's that's most funded most entrenched most um supported by the various people that are also involved in the supply chain where they're you know they have a yeah. special yeah, yeah. deal with the contractor like you're up against the, the story that people have been told by uh, industries that have been trying to keep this kind of thing from happening for hundreds of years. So I, I mean, I'm not saying that it's impossible. I'm just saying like that is a lot of the the work. I think. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Happen. But that's that's just part of the game. Yeah. That's that's what we're after. Yeah. Welcome to the quest for the best. No, this is the then, and we're saying we're going to gobble it up simply because we're collaborating openly. It's like, hey, we're not wasting most of our energy on c competitive waste it's inevitable that our process r leads to that that's what we're trying we're saying we're explicitly trying to design that process in um just by first first principles analysis of it, we're saying we're just removing all the wastes and involving the whole world and so forth boots bootstrapping the thing who's g will anybody say yes to a this hundred thousand dollar turnkey house when they cannot get anything for less than say three hundred fifty thousand dollars on the market, I think you know. I think we have some advantages there. It's not that like anybody even offers the thousand square foot house because nobody builds an expandable, affordable home because people can make money doing larger, more expensive homes, and that's why there is no single thousand square foot house of the kind that we're we're saying. We're saying yes, we can do this. We'll get you a thousand square foot. You can expand it as as you grow with a family. We can also build you a, a bigger one if you like. I mean, it'll be more money. But we're we're uh, tapping a, a market that's not not been fulfilled by anybody or, or uh, provided by anybody because nobody wants to. Part of our game was that nobody wants to do this because they can make more money. Uh, that's part of the 
it's, it's actually a complete advantage to us, I'd say. And we've, yeah. we've seen that trap because we actually, in, in going through this, we're like, well, why aren't we just selling it for a regular price? <laughs> and the answer was, that's not what you do to change the world. So it was a, it was, it was a reality check because the, it turns out that what we do, we can then sell at a higher price. But I think we actually have to say, no, we're an ethical enterprise. We, sl we set different rules because we have different goals. But the economic model still has to work. That, that 100K house better have enough margin to sustain and grow an operation. And I think it does. And that's what we're in the process of proving out in the next. So we're doing two more builds before September. Okay. Uh, so there's July, August still. But no, I mean, this is like, uh, that's all in there. It's, uh, that's all in there. We're throwing I mean, to under the bus there. Kind of make it into a metaphor again. And, and that's just how my, my brain works. And that's one of the things that I like about this project is because it, it does, like I said before, integrate all levels. So you're working on something and it's a metaphor, but it's a thing that itself. Uh, and I usually don't have that. I mean, like, it's usually one or the other. But like, to sell people, I mean, you obviously know more about it than I do, but I would say like, if, if you're going to sell people on the idea of this modular house, it would need to adapt to the environment that you're going to place it in. Of course. And not just the physical one, like the, the idea that you want to make it kind of fit into the landscape, but the fit into the life of the person that would be living there, um, the, the surrounding houses. You know, mm -hmm. So you don't have a one-size-fits-all solution going into it. You, you make it as open to further um, variation, mutation, whatever is possible. So the metaphor for that would be like, you're trying to create social structures in the same way that you're creating physical structures. So I think like bringing people into the project, you have to have the same kind of attitude of adaptability where we don't know what's going to be valuable or what's going to be important about this particular landscape or configuration uh, going in. And it's not going to be a one size fits all. And I guess that's all that I was getting at with the idea of allowing them to have some sort of side project because they might be able to feel a little bit more comfortable having a little bit of a side income while they're giving all of this money to learn new things. But at the same time, the the organization could learn from them, watching them do something that, that they would normally do uh, as, as a way of income. And so maybe that has some sort of use that that person didn't think of. It just goes back to like, no one can have the one holistic uh, view mm -hmm. from the panopticon where you know everything and can make the right decision. Like the people that are doing the thing have to make the decision by doing it, whether yeah. it's building a home or whatever. The unpanopticon is built into the process yeah. because we already have the construction set. We're, we're not the, the Rosebud model. It's, it's a model that's a fully developed thing that we're building right now, but we, that's not what we designed. We designed a construction set. So already in it is a is a graphical thing, which you know, like 40 different configurations. You can do whatever you want to fit various kinds of purposes. So that's that's already built into the process that ability to to modify, and that's where that construction the, the actual designer. That's part of the product release. It's like here's the simple part library software within Sweet Home 3D, and also within FreeCAD where you can drag and drop things. And you can design buildable structures. So not just structures, buildable structures, because the modules are actually buildable. Yeah. So this is, that addresses that, because then you can design any configuration, size, shape you like for various purposes. Yeah, so that was only the, the half of the metaphor to get with um, the flexibility of, of, of a program like the apprenticeship, because rather than having like thousands of different configurations and models, you had like three, where there's like the full price, then the, the discount price, and then the repayment price. And, and what I'm saying is like, there can be as many different configurations of that sort of structure as mm -hmm. there would be for the physical structure of the house, uh, depending on the person's different s schedules and proclivities and abilities and all mm -hmm. that stuff. I mean, it doesn't necessarily apply to me. Like I'm saying, I would like the, the actual immersive uh, six months experience. I'm just saying like going forward, people have different landscapes of their lives, both in terms of 
money and income and things that they need to do, but also just how they think of themselves and how they think about their place in the world. And so like, it needs to be an exchange where y you work that into the design documents, I guess, somehow, not of not the actual ones where the things that you build, but like the social, like you're saying the tribe that you're kind of building, like there's mm -hmm. a, a sort of like social technology to that, that I think needs to be paid attention to. Um, and it's not a separate thing than the actual physical work. Like I, mm -hmm. it's all connected, I think. Yeah. Tell you what, you think you can write a paragraph addendum expressing that, then we can add, you think we can add that to the announcement? That's a va very valid point because we can say uh, that effectively what you're saying is we can negotiate the kind of, str in fact, the guy from Kansas City, we're already talking about a custom structure for him, but, um, um, you think would would you be uh, able to do that or maybe capture that that thought or is that too much to ask or I can definitely try. Uh, probably I would prefer writing several paragraphs and then giving it to you and having you like edit it down to yeah, the yeah. one you like best or something. Yeah, help me out, man. Def definitely, yeah. No, I, I do know there's three options which I thought was good good to cover some cases, but of course there's infinite numbers of cases, and we can. We can be flexible because because uh, it turns out that the people are coming through are have all kinds of different situations that don't fit the box yeah and like i was saying in my case i'm unique in that i could actually be there before it starts to help in in whatever way would be most most mm -hmm. useful to you yeah and, and what i was kind of hoping is that if i do work physically or on the documentation beforehand that would maybe offset or like take a little bit off of the the cost of the program mm-hmm but that wouldn't be a decision that you would have to make beforehand. We could do, you know, like a week or so, and then that would give us time to, to reevaluate and recommit if we want to do another six months or if we, we want to just do something more remote or tangential. Uh, sorry, so, so you're saying, um, what, what's the timing on that like, you're saying? Sorry, I missed. So you're saying like at the end of the six months? No, I'm saying when the six month period starts, mm -hmm. that can be the, the, the point at which, well, a little bit before it, that could be the point at which we decide if I was just helping you out for the month to get ready for it and share some interesting ideas, or if um, I would stick around for the six months and then we could sort of renegotiate terms, I guess is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Well, right before the program, I mean, there's just a lot of, a lot of uh, just build work. Um, which the skill set there would be regarding being able to build things. Um, not sure if, if that's the right time, unless you, okay. you're part of that, that build crew right before that. Um, that's how we're trying to say, okay, once, once we get on site, then we are, we're training everybody and we can collaborate. Because a lot of these things are gonna be hard, but they're made easy by the fact that we have so many people pulling together which kind of brings up another question of, of like endurance. So do you think that um, you think that four hours of work, which is like building things, you think you'd be able to handle that? Or is that going to be a challenge for you? Or is that um, in terms of no, phys it would... just physical shape? Mm. Yeah, no, I'd be fine. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of doing the Appalachian Trail at some point, so I'm mm -hmm. intentionally trying to keep myself in fairly good physical condition. You, do you do a bunch of walking? Uh, running more. Oh yeah. Yeah. How much? How much do you run? Um, like five or six kilometers, probably a a day, most Every days day? of the week. Oh wow! Mm. So, so you are keeping quite good shape. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. So yeah, I'm not worried about that mm -hmm. aspect of it at all. Um, okay. Okay. In terms, I mean, I guess you probably know more than I do if I could do the build work as you describe it. Like, I have just like general knowledge. Um, if it's physical labor, I could definitely do it. If it's something that requires a lot of technical knowledge, maybe not a little technical knowledge, I could probably learn it pretty quickly and be useful to you. But I don't know. Um, I just am trying to avoid the situation where I would have to find a temporary place to stay prior to, to moving again to, to do this. I will say if there's internet, um, pretty much I can make enough money to survive anywhere where I have an internet connection, given like three or four hours a day. Um, yeah, yeah. 
are you saying before or are you saying in the program like I don't know what the the situation was but when I was talking about like side projects to to make money I I was thinking of my own case because I could keep doing like English lessons for example to help offset the cost um, but probably not if it was like a full-time you know eight to five kind of thing well I mean throughout the program that, that is pretty much full-time you probably will be best I mean you get most out of it in terms of learning the things we're going basically through the mechanisms of how to build underlying mechanisms of just about everything so that and then we practice building that so I mean that's that's it's like we're compressing like a PhD in six months <laughs> it's, a, it's a lot it's gonna be a water hose fire hose yeah, I had to learn everything about cryptocurrencies and technical documentation in the last three months. So I yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's probably best that I mean it'll be definitely be a challenge to do both things. Um, probably be uh, compromising one one or the other. Um, yeah. What about before the program? Because I'm I'm fine like with the six months. I think. Uh, yeah, yeah. In terms of arriving early to to stay on site because you, you yeah and being able to make myself useful to the extent where I at least uh, would be able to pay for board or not have that be too too much to, yeah to I be mean, able to yeah I'm open to that I mean we'll, we'll have um, let's see right before that um, I mean for example the the hab lab living units I mean yeah, I mean, there's we we could definitely use some help. I mean, stuff that that's not too difficult. Yeah, we can we can definitely teach you stuff. But it would be it would be like preparing the site. Um, are you are you interested in more like was one constraint that you're actually getting kicked out of wherever you are right now that that lease is ending or such or? I'm living with my parents, so I'm not getting kicked out. Okay. It's just I would prefer to to live on my own because yeah. I got yeah. back from Mexico right before the pandemic struck, and I was just here, so I just stayed for, for a year. When, when would you be interested in, in how many weeks before the actual July 1st? I mean, I now. Now? Ooh. <laughs> well, you, we're building the house this Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Stuff like that. Sure, yeah. Let's do it. Uh, how do you want to, I mean, how do you want to set that up? I mean, are, like volunteering or just an exchange for board or did you want to exchange labor for some of the cost of the program and stuff like that? Um, how, what, what was your thought on that? I would be fine just for, for board. Um, and then like, if you feel like the work that I put in was above and beyond what you would charge for board, then you could take it off of the cost of the program. Yeah, I mean, but like I was saying, that would give us some time to work together and just sort of get like an idea of how it would, you know, what I could um, possibly contribute to the the program in terms of like even helping facilitate or you know doing more physical labor or whatever. Yeah, I mean that's it sounds pretty. I mean, just the complication there is it's um, as far as the program itself, it's like a very focused, dedicated, um, dedicated work. Like right now, it's like I feel like. Um, it's right now. It's pretty rough because there's a lot, a lot of things on the plate. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm thinking, like, how? Okay, what, what would exactly that look like? Um, are you saying that you would? This would be outside of. This is kind of like a test before you would actually try to sign up for the the program, or you're you're committing to the program and then you're saying, oh, okay, I would also arrive early. Like, how are you thinking about this? I was thinking about it as as not committing to the program, but if that's how you would want to do it, then I would be okay with that. If you just want to like f figure out the arrangements up front, but I was just thinking it would give you a little time to know what, you know, mm -hmm. uh, the kind of work that I would I would do. I see, I see. Mm hmm. Yeah. Um, it definitely tells you how a person works works together with you that's the thing now um there is uh, you know like we're the house that i mean the house that we're 
we will have people staying it's like so not ready so that mean we would have to get some infrastructure readied up which I actually can't do myself because I'm totally buried right now with like getting the the blueprints not blueprints but procedures for Thursday and stuff like that like there's mm -hmm. just super busy um, um, so it's kind of it's a challenge in terms of because then you come in here it's it's a mess like where we where we want to have people say that's like still like got the print cluster and it's not cleaned up we're completely cleaning up one house because it's not been used for like the whole year it's got to clean up the hot cobwebs and stuff so um, there's that logistical hurdle that would have to be overcome so we we, we would have to address that but um, so you're saying basically like a, so it could be a trial that I mean that's it's quite a quite a doable thing where we definitely would see how kind of like how you we work together that that's probably right but the thing is that it's a definite that's why we're setting the, the deadline on, on July 1st because uh, it's just tight in terms of time our guy who is the facility manager he's just arriving in two weeks hmm. and maybe that actually would be a much more appropriate time because then I that means He's going to take care of you, and that's why we hired him. He, he's going to be our site manager and collaborator and teacher as well, taking care of the workshop and the infrastructure. So I would actually suggest um, July 1st, like a little after July 1st, when he's settled, and then we can settle you in. Because it's like this is this is a, you know, it's an experimental facility. We're, we're not ready yet. But we, that's, that's the whole preparation for, for July and then for September. Uh, come September, we're we're gonna we will have built more space, like the workshop and some 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 cabins and stuff like that for people. So there's a there's a bunch of infrastructure that's getting built built as well. I mean, this is crazy stuff. It's like we're just popping stuff up and and <laughs> doing it pretty rapidly with rather efficient methods. So yeah, it's a uh, it's a thing. I have a hammock as long as it's warm. I can sleep outside. Like I, I like to do yeah. that anyway. It would be nice, like I said, if there was internet just so I could uh, yeah. have like a small stream of income and not have to drop everything I'm doing. But if not, then I would I would be okay with that. I think it's it'd be worth it. Um, yeah. Are you um, in terms of the kind of like um, the urgency on your side? Like, is it is it that you're like really uncomfortable where you are right now? You you just want to keep moving, or or it's more I've like been let's here, get start this. You know, more than a year. So another two weeks isn't okay. isn't that bad. It's not like I'm yeah, it's not a dire situation I need to escape or anything. I'm just, you know, ready to, to do something. And I can always yeah. maybe uh like visit my friends in Chicago um, yeah. or something like that if I have to. Um Right, right. Um let me talk to my partner about this because this is this is a definite surprise. Like we're, we're uh, having yeah, thought about I just meant it, that so. I could move now. I didn't mean that I did, okay. I had to. So yeah, yeah, take yeah. Your time. Um, yeah, yeah. So I'll, I'll I'll think about what what would really make sense on that because that's I haven't really my brain hasn't gone there at all because there's there is a bunch of just logistical things and stuff like that, just practicalities. Um, mm -hmm. But if we're willing to to work them out, I think I think we can. Just, just the, just in general, the constraint being that I'm like, I'm maxed out myself, uh, you know. Uh, so yeah, I mean, be careful about that. I could also use it as an opportunity to just go through the course material myself and just uh, self learn as much as possible beforehand. Just so, yeah, I'd be. I wouldn't be holding holding people back in any case, if they're more technically minded. But I think I'd be okay. Yeah, yeah. The assumption is that we're we're kind of starting from scratch. Like, literally, it's like a person that's got the the motivation to learn this, and then then we're saying, okay, here's here's the water hose, learn it. Uh, well, the thing is, it's like we're all helping each other, learning and and repeating, just constant repeating of. It, what is I mean? It turns out to be it's not too complicated. It's it's relatively simple, but it, there's a whole ecology of these steps that come together. So it's really about about grabbing this mindset around this this bigger context of how things operate. But I I wouldn't say it's it's it, if you want to learn it, it's it's within a person's reach. I mean, especially a person like yourself, you've got some higher education beyond <laughs> behind yourself and an ability to think. So um, uh, yeah, you, I don't see a, a problem with learning that. Um, yeah okay but let me let me think about that like what's what's the what's the actual practicalities of that um, mm -hmm. 
Perfect. Yeah. And yeah, if you want to just do collaborate on some small remote things, also in the meantime, just send me send whatever it is. My I way. will. I mean, like, we're, we're basically the first thing we say is uh, go through the freak out badge exercise. A, a very basic exercise that shows the the workflow the typical workflow that we do in FreeCAD that's the foundation for doing pretty much any kind of complex design solo or collaborative uh, okay. so that's a definite thing to uh, I can send you a link to that pretty much immediately but but if you can do that I mean there's you know like right now we're going through the CAD and generating um, during various documentation hey is isn't that what you do so yep. <laughs> so so yes we could use help pretty you know okay. a lot of things yeah i have the the free cad already open so you don't need to send me the link if it's the same thing uh free cad badge no i see free cad badge uh free cad badge uh -huh. no I, I i have free cad 101 redirected from osc free cad test i guess okay yeah the page is called osc free cad Badge. Can okay. you find it? Um, yes, gonna... I think two point five. And freecast sixteen would be so. So there's the link I put in the chat box as well. Uh, but yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's pretty cool. Yeah, I'll look through that. Yeah, this is. Um, good to have something else to, to focus on after just uh, having a lot that I did have to think about a lot and now I don't have to to think about oh uh, you talking about with, with, um, about yeah. other things or no yeah with my last job okay um, yeah yeah okay and that reinforces the importance of me of like things truly being open source is because I yeah, things that I had to think about before, I it's no longer useful for me to think about them because I can't use them because they're not really mine. Right, and <laughs> you see the point of how how wasteful. I mean, I, that's like that's waste, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's we gotta get beyond that. So, okay, yeah, but that's the cool thing. Like here, it's it's all about that. Like, I, I think you've captured the culture of how we operate. Like like me, I. Everything goes on my life. Like you can follow what I, all I did, and I do on the wiki, and I f I find value in it because it's like, okay. If we're setting up a, an interesting paradigm of operating, then the world needs to know it, right? And it's it may be disorganized, but somebody who wants to go through it can actually build upon it because it's actually seeded and it's got a taxonomy behind it too. So there's there's some logic behind it. So someone can definitely there is what is known as in. So do you know general semantics, Kozhibsky? Uh Not Kozhibsky, no. I, I guess I know more linguistics than semantics. OK. Uh, but the concept of time binding, that's just a, you, you don't know what that is? OK. So not by that name. Google no. general semantics and time binding. This is, this, this is what we're doing. It's, it's, it's the ability of humanity to build upon, upon prior knowledge. Um, and it's a concept that comes out of general semantics um, a seminal book on how meaning is constructed. So I, I always refer to that because I, I feel it's such a seminal work, but nobody really talks about. Now that's it's also the map is not the territory comes from that. If you want to know where that came from, that comes from general semantics from Kozhibsky. Huh, I thought it was Derrida for some reason. Derrida? Huh. Who's who's that? Uh, when when was that? Um, Jacques Derrida. He's a French theorist from like the sixties. Let me do a quick. Nineteen sixties. Well, sorry, you, not, you missed it by 50, 50 years. This guy wrote this stuff in uh, around the turn of the century, or it was 1920 or something. So I think the, the original stuff of the map is not the territory. Is As far as I know, that's Kozhibsky. Cool. And of course, McLuhan used that, right? Marshall McLuhan? Yeah. yeah. Do you like uh, Borges at all? Jorge Luis Borges? Don't know. Know He's that, a that Argentinian fiction writer, but he had a literalization kind of that saying the map is not the territory about like a Chinese emperor who wanted to create a map the exact size of his empire because he wanted to like um, know every corner of it, and uh -huh. he you know spent eternity just making it bigger and bigger until it covered the actual like kingdom. <laughs> it's pretty cool. <laughs> so the map is the territory. <laughs> as long as well, it's well. a story. 
<laughs> no, I think that that concept is is super profound. Yeah, super yeah. profound. Man. Can't understate it. <laughs> Overstate. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, I look, I think look forward to exploring the future territory. Yeah. Seeing what happens. Okay, so let's uh, let's process this and communicate, and um, follow up soon with you after I chew up what what the offer is here. <laughs> think about it a little <laughs> bit. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I might ask you more questions and stuff like that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. So. Yeah, so good to talk to you. You definitely you can teach uh, teach the crew a, a bit. We can teach teach you a lot too, all of us. <laughs> so it'll be just one crazy learning experience, as far as I'm concerned. So I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you all right. so much. Yep. Have a good night. Take care. See you. Take care. Bye. -bye.